Yeah, but it's fine. I, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Joel. And it's good to be back here. I, I was here almost exactly a year ago. Um, and I'm actually going to borrow some slides from my time when I was here last, because uh, they're just good sort of basic intro to to, uh, um, to quantum gates. But hi, I'm Donnie. I am a quantum computing applications researcher at IBM. My team is focused on researching applications which are very, very near term. So, you know, in the tiny slice of computation between what supercomputers can do today and the things that our quantum computers can produce, which are not simulatable on a quantum computer whenever we reach that point. Just trying to find something useful to do in that tiny slice of computation would be just dandy for me. Um, but obviously a very hard problem and probably not going to happen for another five or so years. But that's what we do. And uh, I do a lot of work in chemistry, uh, machine learning, and um, uh, combinatorial optimization. I know you guys did some density functional theory. We do mostly um, uh, self-consistent fields and coupled cluster, if you guys are familiar with that. So sort of a close cousin of density functional theory. And I'm going to, uh, if we have time, then I'll talk about some of those things. But um, what I want to talk about today is just basically give you an extremely, extremely rapid and high level picture of what are the types of things that modern quantum programmers are doing um, and the uh, ingredients that you need that you might not get as naturally on your own if you're looking at our materials online to ramp up quickly so that you're prepared but I'm not wasting your time telling you things you can read on your own so we'll go through a bunch of uh, a bunch of details about the organization of our tech stack um, tips and tricks for executing on quantum hardware hardware and in simulation that I specifically think are useful for you to know to be able to learn very quickly and may, it might take you weeks to sort of piece together um, if you're just trying to uh, sort of infer tips and tricks from our uh, from our public documentation and things like that. So to start, I want to just go over uh, what quantum logic gates look like um, from, a, from a physics perspective. Um, you already constructed some circuits in Brian's session, and I'm just going to give a little bit more detail about what those circuits do and what the different gates are, and then we're going to start running into what our what IBM's offerings look like, uh, what the software does, and how to interact with them. So to start, I'm going to go back to, are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, there are two notebooks in the Dropbox folder. I encourage you not to open them now. Uh, open them after because we're not really going to be executing them now. They're just there to kind of like uh, uh, for review. And uh, uh, if you want to, there's a lot more content in there than will be in the talk. And I'm going to be jumping around between notebooks and other uh, and and other decks. But uh, that that content, all this stuff that we're presenting, is available to you to review afterwards. Just so you know. Okay. So um, uh, I'm going to go back to Brian's description of the of a uh, a classical system, the penny, um, before we, in order to sort of build our way towards quantum logic gates. So, um, if anybody's ever done uh, finite, auto finite automata in computer science, um, the simplest way to represent computation is as uh, uh, a system of states and transitions between states. And the simplest one that you can pick, well, the, really the simplest one is a system with one state and a transition which, and no transitions, or a transition which goes to itself. But the most uh, non trivial case that you can pick is a two-state system. Um, and so this is an abstract model for computation. Uh, in, in this case, we've got a state which is called our zero state and a state which we've called our one state. And you have transitions from zero to one and one to zero without any rules attached to them. So in principle, this thing is just switching back and forth rapidly. But let's say there's some sort of button that you press that performs the switch. Um, what is this thing for? Why do we use it? This is a model of things which we've observed in nature. For example, a penny or a light switch. Really, more of the, let's say, the light switch because the penny is spinning so rapidly, um, you know, or let's say uh, uh, another system which can be described as having two states, like a drawbridge that switches back and forth. And the analogy for why this is useful is that you don't necessarily have control over a drawbridge without breaking some laws. And so if you want to know what will happen to the drawbridge, if you were to switch it several times, you can walk over to a light switch, which represents the same abstract model of computation and flip it a bunch of times. And that gives you access to a computational simulation of your drawbridge. Um, and so what we do with qubits is fundamentally the same idea. Um, the qubit, as we've described, is essentially your two-state system from a measurement perspective, but the transitions that it can um, that that it can um, uh, embody are more complex and include what we call. Um, uh, 
no one else in physics calls it this, but an easy way to think of it is sort of hidden information, which is the phase information. So if you've got a typical two-state system, like um, an ammonia molecule, which uh, can be spinning in an relative to a particular measurement, right? If this is not just the, these are not the only states of the ammonia molecule, but a measurement of the spin direction of the molecule, you know, will yield the following abstract system. The ammonia molecule can be spinning up, meaning that its rotation is counterclockwise relative to some up axis, or clockwise relative to that up, uh, to that, or counterclockwise relative to a down axis. So one of, you know, depending on basically how you measure the magnetization of your ammonia molecule using electromagnetic waves or something like that, you'll see one of these two systems. However, um, this doesn't behave like, behave like a light switch. It behaves like a different system, which we call a qubit, where the system itself has different ways of transitioning from the zero state to the one state. So if we call our ammonia molecule zero state and we call, up, we call the up of the ammonia molecule the zero state, and we call the down the one state, then rather than just being like a light switch where it only has, there's no uh, choice in how to transition between the two, we have a, a range of possible transition. So if we're just talking about a classical system, which is probabilistic, which is sort of the next extension of our two-state system, where you can embody transitions between zero and one, meaning you can be, let's say, like a corn flip, uh, a coin flip, you can have a 50% chance of being zero, 50% chance of being one, you've got a one-dimensional transition between your two possible, your zero and one state, right? Because you can be 50% zero, 50% one, 25% uh, zero, 25% one, 75% one, etc. So that's a different way to add continuity to the to the space of transitions. But in quantum mechanics, we um, uh, we have even more information in our transitions. Um, you have information called uh, phase of your. Uh, uh, of your superposition in this case. So um, uh, in, let's say, that probabilistic case where your coin can be 50% zero state plus 50% one state, in quantum mechanics, you can have 50% zero state minus 50% one state. Or you can have uh, a difference between the two states of, of uh, I or any complex uh, phase. So that information is essentially our hidden information. And uh, if you imagine the state of our ammonia molecules, the sphere here, um, the zero Zero state of the uh, this is going to become our computational model. Don't imagine that the ammonia molecule actually looks in space like anything like this. This is just a model for these states that we're trying to describe, similar to the comparison between a light switch and the two-state system. Um, we call our up state of our ammonia molecule, where it's completely in the up state. We've just measured it; it's definitively in the up state. Uh, the zero state at the top of the of the sphere here, and we call our down state of the ammonia molecule, where we just measured it, it's definitively in the one state, in the, in the down state, one, which is at the very bottom of the sphere. If we were working with a probabilistic model, then the, spa the, the, the line between zero and one would be the states that we were concerned with that, would, that embodied a continuous transition. But because it's a quantum mechanical system, and it can be uh, not only zero plus one, it can also be zero minus one, or zero plus i, or zero plus minus i, et cetera, then we call this ring around the outside of the, the, the equator of the sphere, which is where we basically put that phase information. So on the complex plane, the phase of your, uh, the angle of your complex number that you're working with uh, is, uh, can, be, can be plotted on a sphere. That angle on the complex plane is the equator here. Don't worry if this is going quickly for you. You just have to know that the, these states exist. Um, and so um, where we are on this equator basically tells us what the complex number, which embodies the sort of the difference between the zero state and the one state is uh, is of our ammonia molecule. So if our ammonia molecule is in the zero plus one state, we say that there's no relative complex phase between them. And so that's what we call being at this point here, zero plus one. And if we move a little bit more towards the down state so that there's more probability of being measured in the down state, that's moving a little bit towards the one axis down here. So let's say 75% chance of being down and 25% chance of being up would be somewhere a little bit below the equator here. But if we go to the zero minus one state, we're moving across and we're introducing a complex phase of pi, 50% of the way around the complex plane. And that's over here, that minus one state. 
And note that we have the same probability of measuring the zero state and measuring the one state when we're at the zero minus one state as we are in the zero plus one state. Sorry that the ones are getting mixed up. Let's say the up plus down state and the up minus down state. We have the same probability of measuring up and down, but that but we have a phase difference. That phase difference, if the only thing we were looking at was just this one molecule, um, would be pretty hard. What might be difficult for us to observe, but there are ways of getting at what that phase difference. How to, there are ways of actually measuring the phase difference, and that's how we know that it exists. And this is the essence of quantum inter interference. But all these other things are also valid. All these other points on the sphere. So uh, up plus i down is this one. Up minus i down is this one. And this is our this is our abstract model of what a bit looks like when you get down to the quantum mechanical level. This is the big discovery and the big controversy is that there is more information down there than we thought. There is not just a simple probabilistic transition where you're at 25% one state, 75% uh, the other. There's more information. And that's the phase information. So um, this is the abstract model of a quantum mechanical bit. It turns out that lots of things behave this way. So in, a, uh, in electronic structure theory, the uh, occupancy of a particular orbital, whether there's an electron in it or not, behaves this way. Um, and so do many, many other quantum systems. You know, you, you guys are doing lattice gauge theory. There are, uh, you know, if, if you take an Ising model and the, uh, the magnetization of each of your, uh, of your lattice sites and the Ising model can be represented by qubits relatively easily. We call these things qubits. Um, that's how we actually do Ising model uh, solutions on the quantum computers is we just take each of your lattice sites whether, and you translate it directly onto the device as a, each of those lattice sites is a qubit. And if you want to be really, really, uh, if you want to be really convenient about it, you make the connectivity of your lattice identical to the connectivity of the of the uh, qubits on the device, meaning which ones can have C knots between them, which qubits can have uh, uh, those C knot gates between them. But um, this is our model, and we control this model. The, the reason that we care about this, aside from the fact that lots of things in nature actually look this way, the reason why I care about it is because in recent years we have um, developed a small number of light switches that give us control over models which embody these characteristics, and uh, and therefore can you know uh, can give us good examples of interference, can give us good examples of uh, of the types of um, degrees of freedom that you get when you have entanglement in the system or control over the entanglement in the system. And we want to use these models in order to represent systems that we care about, like electronic structure or nuclear structure or uh, you know abstract things like machine learned systems and things like that, or optim optimization, where you're using these types of things to represent uh, maritime routing or traveling salesmen or, or graph problems and things like that. So th these are some uh, light switches that we have access to. The ones that we use at IBM are called Joseph syndrome. Junctions. There are microwaves resonating on superconductors. There are actually multiple ways to do Josephson junctions. We use flux qubits. Um, uh, Google uses, uh, yeah, I think we use flux qubits. I don't really know. I know basically nothing about experimental hardware. Um, we use one of these. Uh, Google uses one of these, but a slightly different one. Uh, Rigetti uses the, one of these that's the same as ours. IonQ is a different quantum computing startup in Maryland that uses. Uh, um, ions, one of these, don't even remember, one of them, trapped ions is what the technology is is called the one that was quite popular a bit ago but not as uh, but not as big for the type of quantum computing that I do is called uh, NMR um, so there's all this oh no optical lattices that's the one that's the one that um, IonQ uses so there's all these different technologies that people are trying to basically bet against are going to give us access uh, fine control of a quantum mechanical system like the one that uh, that I just showed you and uh, the discovery that lots and lots of things in nature, behave this way is another way of describing the discovery of quantum mechanics and like why quantum mechanics is important. When you probably learned quantum mechanics the first time, you did it on a continuous basis probably and you didn't start from bits, but everything that you do on a continuous basis basically can be converted to bits and they're sort of interchangeable. Nowadays, a lot of uh, physics programs are switching to introduce quantum mechanics on the basis of qubits and not on the basis of the types of continuous models that we're used to seeing like when you learn the Schrodinger equation over, like, uh, over a continuous line to represent like Newtonian physics and stuff like that. So uh, this is sort of our bread and butter, just interacting with qubits in this way. Um, and uh, 
the, uh, the X and Y gates that, that Brian was showing you before are just different ways to transition from the zero state down to the one state through the sphere, right? Because we used to just have a single phase transition, so the operation of the not operation on a classical computer is just a single operation, very straightforward. But here we've got infinitely many different ways that we could possibly transition from the zero state to the one state. Um, and uh, so uh, what we call an X gate or a, or a not is, is the transition from the zero to the one through the, uh, was that an X gate? Uh, this one is an X, this one's a Y rotation, this one's an X rotation. So what we say is, uh, actually this is, this is a backwards X rotation. I wrote these slides a long time ago and I was much stupider. So the, uh, uh, and that, so what we call an X rotation is a rotation around the X axis of this sphere, okay? So the X axis goes through the no phase point on the equator and uh, you don't have to remember all this stuff. Uh, in practice, these spheres are a lot less convenient when you move up to more and more qubits they're just kind of a nice way to learn these things the first time. Um, when we go from the zero state to the one state, um, or we basically take a rotation of, uh, we, we, we flip our state by uh, an angle of pi around the sphere, around the x-axis, we call that an x-rotation. So the one that we put on the circuit before, which flipped us entirely from the zero state down to the one state, was uh, uh, an x-rotation by an angle of pi. But you can rotate by an arbitrary angle. You can rotate halfway down, you can rotate, which would put you in uh, the negative i state, which would have an equal probability of zero and one with a phase difference of minus i. Um, you can also rotate around the y axis. So again, all right hand rules, rotating down um, and going through where the uh, x axis hits the equator. Um, and all these rotations work even if you're not starting from the zero state. So if you start from the one state, the y rotation will take you back up the other side. But it'll also work if you're just like sitting over here and then you do a random rotation of y by a Y rotation by uh, pi over three or something like that and take yourself to a different place. And this is the essence of how we manipulate these qubits is with these rotations. Um, the way that the, describing them as rotations is sort of like a convenience, but um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of this stuff takes a little bit of time to get used to, but we're going to look at some modern algorithms, like algorithms that um, are things that are most recently were published on the cover of Nature, which just understanding that these rotations is basically enough for you to understand how the algorithm works, which is a pretty neat thing. Um, one other thing I want to tell you is the Hadamard gate that Brian was showing you before. So one thing that you might be thinking is, oh, I know how to create superposition on a quantum circuit. I just do, or like, first of all, you can now create any kind of superposition, but I know how to create the specific kind that we built in the last class, which is the zero plus one state. I just do a Y rotation down um, down the uh, by pi over two um, around the Y axis, and I'm going to land right here, which is the zero plus one state, which is what we would do if, physics, if physicists didn't want to make your life difficult, which is what you could do if you wanted to. But what we do is the Hadamard gate, which is uh, just close your eyes and don't let this hurt you, is a rotation around the oblique x equals z axis. So you're going from, you're going this way and you're going from the zero state down around the x, so the z axis is the top one, so the x equals z goes diagonally this way and we're going around it down to the x gate. And the reason why we do this is because, uh, well, part of it is, some of it is historical reasons, but the Hadamard gate is a very useful gate for identifying whether you are in a, the Y gate will do this too, by the way. The, the thing I want to describe, the Y gate will do too, but there are other things about the Hadamard gate which are important. Yeah. Oh, is the Y-axis rotation? The yeah. Bottom one is an X -axis rotation? The bottom one is a reverse of an X-axis rotation. I was hoping when I noticed the error that it was like, oh, I just swapped the two. But no, not only did I swap the two, the Y rotation goes, uh, the X rotation goes around the X-axis in this direction, right? So it should be going the other way around. Because you take the, your right hand, you point in the direction of the axis, and then you rotate in that direction as a positive rotation. This is an X rotation of minus pi over two, the bottom one. Yeah, again, physicists are trying to destroy you, and I'll include myself in that. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, uh, the nice thing about the Hadamard gate 
is that this hidden information, the phase information, is not nothing, right? It's easily observable. So the easiest way to see it is that if I'm in the zero state and I do a Hadamard gate, I end up in the in the x the zero plus one state, right? But if I'm in the one state and I do a Hadamard rotation, I end up in the minus one state, okay? So sorry, the zero minus one state. We call this the plus state and we call this the minus state. So this is zero, one, plus, minus, and this is minus i and this is plus i. These are all just convenience things. In practice, if you're working on algorithms, you don't really use that information that much, but the way, the reason the Hadamard gate or the even the pi over two, the y rotation does the same thing, but stick with me on the Hadamard gate for a moment, is that if you're in either of these two states, measurement alone makes them indistinguishable, right? If you measure in this state, you're gonna get 50% chance of zero, 50% chance of one. So if you measure your state repeatedly, you, this is going to look identical to this one, because in this state, you measure in this state, you're gonna get 50% chance of zero, 50% chance of one. Well, the way that you can distinguish them is if you perform a Hadamard gate on them, because if you do the Hadamard, in this state, and you do that rotation, you'll end up back in the zero. And if you do the Hadamard rotation when you're in the minus one state, you'll end up in the one, you'll be, end up in the one place. So if you need to know whether the state that you were looking at or care about had a positive or negative phase in between it, um, you can do a Hadamard rotation, and, and whether you measure zero or one will give you that will give you that state. That's a very very basic 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 case or description of what we call state tomography, where um, the medical world does this thing called tomography, which is where you've got something um, some boo boo or something like that, and they want to characterize it fully, so they take light or sound or lasers or whatever the medical world does for fun nowadays and they point it at your thing from every different direction and they reconstruct a picture from that and we took that or not me but you know people who do state tomography took that and they do that with that's that's how they describe what we're doing if we want to understand a state completely if you want to understand a state down to very 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 precise levels all you have to do is just do all the rotations to understand okay is it you know I measure it along I, I, I measure it when it's as is to do measure the probability between zero and one. But what I can also do is rotate it by Hadamard. And then what I'm doing is I'm measuring basically where it lies on this line, whether it's in the one state or the minus one state. And I can also do a different thing which looks like a Hadamard, but it's a rotation around the zy axis to figure out where it is relative to this, the i or minus i. And then I have an extremely complete picture of my qubit. The reason I had to do this on three axes instead of just the two axes if you're really, really, really playing along here, and I don't expect any of you to see this naturally, if I wanted to know where I am on the sphere, I only have to measure two axes, right? I just need the up and down and the phase. If I wanna know where I am inside the sphere, which is a completely different concept, which is where you have an incomplete picture of the qubit itself, and you're not exactly sure where you are in the sphere, you're sort of in between some points, then you need to measure all three axes. So this is, there, this is just to give you a picture of the fact that there is so much work in this field. There are people doing all different types of stuff, um, but this this is the basic bit picture of quantum computation on a single qubit. This is already an extreme jump from this from the the classical bit, right? Like when you learn about two state systems in computer science, you go through them in, uh, in like 20 seconds because there's only one thing you can do with them, which is, there's two things. You can do the identity, which is nothing, and you can do a not operation, but there's no complexity to it. Um, and I'd like to say that the single qubit is so powerful that like, you know, we could spend much, much more time on it, but in reality, things really only get interesting when you go to multiple bits. Um, and so, oh, and there's one more rotation, which is called a Z rotation, which is where you just arbitrarily control the phase. You just like rotate around the Z axis and all you're doing is just changing the phase by whatever you want to. So another way to think about the Hadamard rotation is as a composition of, uh, of um, you can, it's in the slides, but you can compose any three rotations by two orthogonal rotations. So basically, if I have access to just an X rotation and just a Z rotation, and then one more X rotation at the end, I can perform any single cubo rotation I want. It happens to be that you only need two rotations to build a Hadamard, but just know that uh, this is a theme in quantum computing. If you want to be able to produce any single cubo rotation, all you need to have access to is two orthogonal directions and three rotations total, okay?
orthogonal directions being z and x, or x and y, or something like that. Um, this is a more detailed description of a Hadamard, and uh, you'll have access to it. Um, and then I'm going to go very quickly through two qubit operations because they're a little bit, uh, they're simpler on the surface, but they're much, much, they're, they're where all the complexity comes in. Um, a two qubit operation, the easiest way to describe, a two, there are many different ways to frame a two qubit operation, but uh, one way to describe uh, the basic, basic two qubit operation that we use is as a controlled operation. So basically, if you've got multiple states, um, if you've composed two qubits together, and so the total total state of the system is just basically the tensor product of the gluing of the state of one and the state of other, which is literally just, you know, one of them is zero plus one and one of the other one is zero plus one. You just multiply across, you distribute that. So you have zero, zero plus zero, one plus one, zero plus one, one. That's how it works. Uh, magic stuff. Um, if you if you've just cared about, decided that you're looking at two systems and that's what your state looks like, your two qubit operations are basically just, uh, uh, you could imagine Imagine that they're acting on these individual systems sort of separately, and the way that they manipulate each of the systems separately is what you're, how you're going to get the behavior of interference and the changes of phases on the individual systems um, interfering with one another is how you're going to get all the complexity that comes from two qubit operations. So the, the way that we talk about two qubit operations is that there's a control qubit and a target qubit. So you imagine I've got two block spheres. That sphere is called a block sphere. Sorry, I didn't mention that before. Um, you got two qubits, and uh, and you want to perform an operation which incorporates, as a logical consequence, the states of both. So one of the things that you can do is this control operation where you basically uh, say that if one of my qubits is in the zero state, then do nothing to my my target qubit. But if my if if my control qubit, my one qubit that I've de designated as my control qubit is in the one state, then perform such and such single qubit rotation on the other qubit. Okay. And there's a deceptive thing about this, which is that it looks like the information is flowing from one qubit to the other. In reality, that's not the case, and we'll talk about why in a second. But this is the simple structure of a of a two qubit operation. It happens to be that the only two qubit operation that you can perform on our device device is a controlled not operation, meaning a controlled x rotation by pi over 2. You, uh, you designate your two qubits, you check whether they're actually connected on the device, meaning that they actually can support a two qubit operation, and then you designate one of them as your control and one of them as your target, and then when, we actually, when, the, when the computation is actually performed, for each of the states, the possible states of the two state system, what this controlled not gate will do is it'll go through and it'll say, okay, so your state is 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, plus 1, 1. Okay, so the 0, 0 state becomes 0, 0 because the control qubit is 0, so we do nothing. The control qubit on the 0, 1 state is also 0, so we do nothing to this one too. But the control qubit on this state, 1, 0, is a 1, so we're going to perform the not operation on the other one, and we get 1, 1. And this state, we're going to do uh, control, there are control qubit is 1, uh, so we'll perform the not operation, and we'll flip this one. Notice that this does nothing to our state in this case, right? We basically, the way that we produce this state of 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, plus 1, 1, is we just put two Hadamards on each of our two qubits, Right, and that produces superposition in both, and then that's we get basically just very even superposition through this whole thing. Um, by the way, I dropped all the coefficients because that's what you do, I guess, when you uh, get lazy and old. So the um, but this state, the C not did nothing to the state because these two just switched, right? But you can you will uh, we'll look at a case here where the C not does uh, something which is impossible to do in a, when you're not working with quantum systems, which is when you only had a mar the control qubit, which is the case that we looked at the very last circuit that Brian did. When you only had a mar um, the control qubit, which we're going to say is the second one here, and you leave the first qubit as a zero. Um, am I looking at the right? Ah, this is the uh, zero zero. No, sorry. This is the equal superposition case. This is the case that we care about. So now we've got two qubits, zero, zero and zero, right here. These are our two states. 
putting these in brackets around the qubit like this is just a way of saying the number is just a way of saying this is a state. It's not a. Uh, it's not a, the number zero. You could put anything in there. It doesn't have to be a zero. It could be pickle or banana. It's just a way of labeling your state. And uh, you are in the zero state here. And you you're performing a Hadamard on one of your qubits over here. So that takes you into this state. Because your first qubit became 0 plus 1, and your second qubit was just 0. And you distribute it out. You multiply these two qubits across. So uh, zero, one, uh, 0 times 0 is 1 of that. 0 times 1 is this first qubit, and 0 is the second qubit. Um, oh, I left in the coefficient. How thoughtful. So um, now let's perform a CNOT from the first qubit onto the second qubit. So the first qubit's the control, and the second qubit is the target. So what the CNOT is going to do is it's going to look at each of these states one by one, and it's going to say, OK, for this state, the control qubit is 0, so do nothing to it. Leave it alone. But for the second state, the control qubit is a 1, so flip the second one. OK? So now we've got this state, which if you've taken physics, you know is a bell pair. And this represents an inseparable state. This is entanglement. We could not possibly describe the state of one qubit without the incorporation of, this, of the description of the state of the other qubit. Or in other words, if we measure one qubit, then we are definitively producing a particular uh, state on the other qubit. If we measure this first qubit, then the second qubit will definitely be a 0 or will definitely be a 1. Okay, So this is where the magic happens. And it happens to be just like you only needed three single qubit rotations to produce any, qubit, any single qubit rotation. You only need one two qubit gate to be able to do all the two qubit and three qubit and five qubit and all possible operations that you could ever want. As long as you have a single two qubit gate and arbitrary single qubit rotations, really you only need the two single qubit rotations, then you can do any possible quantum computation you could ever need. In fact, that area of research, basically what's the minimum gate set that you could possibly need, is an interesting one. And it really gets to the heart of what is the actual power in quantum computation, because identifying with extreme precision what is a minimum thing that you could have access to to be able to do something which is not simulatable by a quantum computer is a way of understanding sort of getting to the inside of what is actually defines what actually defines the difference between classical and quantum computation. And it turns out that you can have access to CNOTs, Hadamards, Xs, Ys, even X over 2, Y over 2, and all of that is classically simulatable. And the thing that breaks it all, the thing you can have access to Z, Z over 2, etc. The thing which, uh, which breaks it all is either a controlled controlled not gate with just access to a controlled controlled not gate you have bro you have access to computation which is not classically simulatable if you have arbitrarily many of those or a z over 4 gate which is also called a t gate so sorry a z pi over 4 rotation so if you can do z rotations by pi over 4 that is the magic key to doing arbitrary quantum computation. Also, if you have arbitrary rotations, you can do anything. But if you only have access to a few gates, if you have like CNOTs, Hadamards, and just this T gate, that gives you anything. It's a weird thing that I don't know a lot about and don't understand. But it's it's like you would think that if you had access to the Hadamards and CNOTs, for sure you'd be able to do everything. But no, that's all so that's all classically simulatable. Um, Wild stuff. OK. So um, just one final thing is I'm going to tell you why you are going to see a lot of circuit diagrams if you choose to embark on this journey, and that the circuit diagrams are confusing, and you should only really use them as like a mnemonic, similar to like a, you know, if you were reading music, you wouldn't look at a piece of music, unless you're like a musical genius, I guess. But um, assuming that you're a normal person, you look at music, and you don't, uh, you know, you would never look at like a, you know, a book of sheet music and be like, oh, this is uh, Stacy's mom. I recognize this. Like you would, you would use it as a mnemonic if you were attempting to play the music, right? I would always recognize that. You would, yeah, Brian, Brian performed that all through his high school years. So the uh, the same is true with the quantum circuits. You should use them as a mnemonic, but the only thing that really describes what's happening end-to-end -end is if you go through and actually do those equations or you do some sort of simulation to understand. To me, coding it up is the fastest thing usually, which is a shame because I would probably be a much better physicist if I actually did the equations. But um, here's an example of why, CNOT, why um, uh, 
circuit diagrams will destroy you. So the, uh, the, the controlled Z operation seems totally straightforward, right? There is a control qubit. Oh, by the way, circuit diagrams, they represent each of these qubits as wires. And this is sort of the direction of time. This is sort of an interesting thing about quantum computation. In a normal computer, the wires are stationary and the pulses move through the wires. So we sort of imagine co computation in a classical computer like water flowing through a system sort of. Whereas a quantum computer, the qubits sit in place and we fire microwave pulses at them and then we measure them at the end. So the, the, there's no creation or deletion of bits or anything like there's no, um, uh, you know, microwave, there's, you know, in a classical computer, the, 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 the electrical lines can meet and then produce a new signal. Like there's none of that because the qubits just sit in place. So these are the qubits and these are the things, the gates are the things that we're doing to them and all these gates represent microwave pulses and they're converted down to microwave pulses. So here's one which is the control Z operation. Um, this can be composed out of single cube rotations and C knots. In fact, it's basically if you take a C knot and put um, a Hadamard on either side of the target qubit, that will produce a control Z operation. Um, but uh, it looks like this qubit is not affected by the operation, right? Because all we're doing is looking at it to decide whether to do the Z operation on the second qubit. But in reality, the, scene, the controlled Z operation is symmetric, meaning the Z operation from this qubit to this qubit is identical to the controlled Z operation from the bottom qubit to the top qubit. If you learned computer science and gate rule, I don't know, if you, to most people I think this should look insane. Um, it's just because circuit diagrams are, it's a nuance of circuit diagrams and it just should show you that you shouldn't trust them when you look at them, that it's so obvious what's going on. Um, I'm not gonna explain exactly what's happening here, but in, in reality, like, you can look at these equations. It's not an easy thing to explain. It's not an easy thing to understand. It's kind of something you just like get used to. That like uh, the 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 circuit is more just sort of like a sit a filter and not it's a feeding operations from one qubit to another. It's like a filter on your states, sort of. Um, okay. Um, now that we've talked about that, we're going to move to the software. We're about uh, halfway. Are there any questions about the about gate operations before we move on to descriptions of the software? Yeah. Uh, of the control not gate, how are you doing that without collapsing the state of the uh, control? Yeah, so that's why it's not a good idea to think of it as looking at one in order to do a thing on the other. Um, in practice, what you're doing is you're performing an operation to your, so the way that you don't, you're not collapsing anything is because you don't read anything from the state. You're just sort of sending information in. So an analogy is like if you flip two coins and you had a machine which could blast them with light in such a way that like you could make it so that if one, one coin, one coin state was such and such thing, then it would affect the state of the other coin while they were in the air and you didn't look. And then just however they fell was what was sort of affected, their correlation. Um, but in practice, so I don't completely understand the nuance of how this happens under the hood in the device. The device doesn't actually do a C not gate. It does some, a different type of two cubic gate, which is like uh, X's and Z's and stuff like that. But um, there's a different type of device called an I called a cold ion um, device, which I think has a more, uh, a more straightforward way of understanding it. Basically uh, the way that they do a C naught is like so. Let's say you have two of these ions, and the states that they're uh, the state of the uh, ion has, has is basically just like the energy of something having to do with the ion's energy. It happens to be that if you excite these ions up to a really really high energy level, then uh, it, if you excite these ions up to a really high energy level, then an ion that's very close to it can't excite up to that energy level to it, like blocks everything around it. So if you perform that excitation in a way which is uh, which is quantum mechanical, meaning that there's uh, you know a 50% chance that it's excited up to the energy level, a 50% chance that it's not excited. Then when you perform the attempt to excite one that's nearby, then for the 50% probability that it's not excited, then that ion will switch to one, and for the probability that it is excited, it won't. So now these two are entangled. However you measure one will dictate how you measure the other. It's like an analogy for how this sort of works in a way that you're not measuring them. Um, but I, I couldn't. It's like with us. It's like the way that we perform a two qubit gate is like you drive one of the qubits at, a, at the microwave at the frequency of another qubit, and that somehow does something. I don't know. The microwave electronics is messy business. Um, any other questions before we move on? 
Yes. So the complexity uh, operation is symmetric, then finally you will always end up with zero zero. Oh, that, well, so if you, it depends what you send in here. If you send in zero zero into here, then the controlled Z operation will do nothing, right? In the same way as if you, yeah, uh, uh, if you send in a uh, like. Um, one way that it could, so the one way to imagine what the control Z operation, excuse me, does is like if you have um, a state coming in here which is zero one and a state here which is uh, which is one. Okay, so if you send those both in, then this one will cause the controlled the the, the phase of the zero one to be zero minus one. So zero plus one will be zero minus one. And if you do another Hadamard on the end, then the state of this will flip to zero. What will be one because it was zero minus one instead of zero plus one. So like the, it's hard to ex explain exactly, but the uh, the 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 control Z operation is doing something similar to what a Z operation would do at a normal circuit. If you go on a, on a single qubit, if you go back to this slide over here in the deck you can follow this through very in like in extreme detail that it'll basically show you what a single z rotation really does to the qubit so it's easier to understand if you kind of like walk through it in detail it's a little bit difficult to explain but it's basically like just performing a phase change even though the probabilities end up measuring the same way will affect you later because you can always change, you can always perform a Hadamard, which is what will expose your face. So it's, it's a little bit tricky, but yeah. So why, 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 why would you have the minus one state? Well, that's what the controlled Z operation is. The controlled Z operation is basically doing your, uh, the Z operation is how you perform that phase change where you make one of them negative. But the, 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 the what the negative really means is the thing which takes a long time to get used to and is sort of tricky, and that's why it's better to go through an example. Because like otherwise, the difference between zero plus one and zero minus one seems like it's just semantics, right? Like it seems like we just like made that up, but it has real, uh, it, like it has real measurable implications, which are like, you know, after you do the rotation, you can expose whether it's negative or, or positive. The real, real explanation for why we use this particular convention where we call some things negative or I or my or or um, uh, positive, whatever, is um, that uh, the original original description of quantum mechanics was this was wave mechanics, where all these states are represented by waves all around the complex plane, and the phase of the wave is the thing that we're describing as positive or negative or i or minus i, and that's earlier up here. If you go through this, if you go through this uh, deck, you'll see like a, a sort of like loose description of what we mean when we say like minus one, a particular state is minus one versus positive one. Yeah. Any other questions before we move on? This should not like feel obvious in any way. It takes a, real, a long time to get used to, but like these are the conventions, and like this is the fastest way to get moving towards writing, like understanding modern algorithms and stuff like that. Okay, so um, in principle, that was all intro, and we're going to run through a bunch of this uh, rapid stuff. These two notebooks that I put inside of the the um, the Dropbox together, they're about a four to five hour presentation. So we're not going through even a fraction of them today. I'm just going to describe things at a high level, but they're there for you if you want to go through them in detail. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm going to just quickly describe kind of what IBM offers today and like what uh, what uh, the picture of quantum computing at IBM and most other tech companies that do this kind of looks like, uh, meaning meaning what the, what there is to kind of do, um, and then go into a little bit more detail about what we're actually working with. So um, the first thing is, uh, oh, I clicked something by accident. Okay, so we have basically two sort of sections of the offering. We have the uh, software stack, which is called Qiskit. It's all open source. It's basically uh, Python. There's some C in there, but it's mostly behind the scenes. The interfaces are almost entirely Python, but uh, uh, Python tools for uh, preparing, creating circuits, compiling the circuits so that they can be run on a device, because if you create CNOTs that aren't actually support on the device, we need to manipulate the circuit to allow that not to happen 
under the hood. Uh, you know, you might use the gates that we don't allow on the device, like the device only actually executes certain gates and we compile your gates into the device, the gates on the device. All that compilation, all the circuit construction, um, full algorithms, like algorithms that you might learn about in a textbook, but also um, very, very new algorithms that are coming out all the time, like grad students who are implementing a new algorithm or a tweak to an algorithm oftentimes will check code directly into the code base. Um, so uh, that's all basically KISKID. It's all public, open source. You can look at it. You can look at it. It's not necessarily easy to understand, but it, it exists out in the open. And so it's you know easier. You can debug it and, and stuff like that. Um, and then we have the devices. The devices are basically sitting on IBM Q property, so IBM property somewhere. And it is a refrigerator and a piece of quantum hardware, or a quantum computer inside of it. I promise they are real. Actually, well, someone promised me that they are real. So subject to someone else's promise, I promise that they are real. And uh, that's, see, that's an example of a, of a CNOT, right? If that person's promise is broken, then mine is null and void. So um, the uh, devices are behind a cloud, right? We, we behind a, a cloud API. You don't really have to worry about the API. Kiskit takes care of that for you, but you could theoretically send things to us in JSON format. We have like a small number of people who do that instead of using Kiskit to send it they just like send it directly to the API endpoint which is like a hilariously unnecessary thing to do with like a hacker um, but uh, you know it, the same thing will happen so you can do that um, the uh, uh, the devices basically what you're getting when you send something to one of these public devices is we'll take your code uh, you write Python code it compiles into basically a JSON object which describes your gates and things like that in a way that the, they're, they're actually compatible with the device we take that JSON we convert it into microwave pulses well first you wait in the queue then we convert it into microwave pulses we blast the device with your with your specified set of microwave pulses however many times you tell us to do it so that's what the shot number is because when if you execute just a single time you're just going to get a single bit string out from the device and oftentimes you're trying to like figure out am I in the zero plus one state because if I am I need to basically measure like a thousand times to get a good picture of whether I'm in the zero plus one state exactly or I'm in like the 75% zero 25% one state etc so that you do you're, you're doing almost like a Monte Carlo when you when you run something on the device you run it many times and you're observing the probability distribution that comes back of all the different possible measurements um, the uh, by the way even those measurements are subject to the you know the, like, remember that this is a piece of physical like physics experimental hardware the device doesn't scream zero one one zero when we get the readout back right it's a bunch of microwave readouts that we have to use a, dis a discriminator like you know essentially like a classical machine learning model to tell whether this is supposed to be a z whether this is a zero whether it's a one all this stuff is just to tell you that the fact that you can do a uh, single qubit operation if you actually talk to the hardware people is a very very serious achievement and the fact that you can do CNOTs is like a freaking miracle it's crazy that we're able to do multiple CNOTs given how much complexity there is under the hood that like we can make it all look so clean to the outside world so um, but it's not clean it's really messy um, and uh, a lot of people do research just like from the outside, sending gates down to our device to characterize where their flaws are and things like that. So um, th those are the devices. There are private devices, which Brian showed you before. There are public devices, which are um, larger. There are 20 qubit devices, and we're working on a 58 qubit device. And uh, the uh, 20, we have two 20 qubit devices. There are you know, a couple million dollars to gain like a few years of access to them. There was like a big deal with the Air Force recently if you want to go look up exact numbers that were like published online but we have a big deal with the Department of Energy through the Oak Ridge National Lab so if you work with uh, someone if like your PI um, uh, has connections at Oak Ridge you might be able to gain access to some private devices that way we have some researchers at, at public institutions which applied to Oak Ridge for access to our devices and use the private devices so that's certainly a possible thing you don't got to cough up any money uh, I mean uh, money but like you know, you'll have to cough up the time of your research life, but the, like you can use Oak Ridge's time on our devices. So um, that's the split of the offerings. The uh, Kiskit stack is split. Um, 
in marketing terms, it's split into four. In reality, I'll show you the true picture just so that you won't be confused. Um, there are four components to Kiskit, let's say. There is Terra, which is sort of the ground layer, which is uh, where you construct and compile circuits. Um, Terra is, in principle, built to be able to take an arbitrary circuit and compile it for arbitrary hardware. Meaning, even if you've got a completely different set of gates that your hardware supports, you've got a completely different connectivity between your qubits, um, as long as it's a gate model quantum computer, you can tell Terra, okay, these are the gates that I want you to compile my circuit into, this is the connectivity that I want you to convert it to, etc. And it, the idea is that it will abstract that away from the user. It's not fully abstracted because because if you introduce, you know, 80 C knots in order to convert the circuit that the user started with to one that works on your particular hardware, then assuming that you're running superconducting qubits or modern quantum hardware, those C knots are going to introduce a tremendous amount of noise and the computation is going to be meaningless. But uh, it's, so it's not totally abstracted from the user. And even you as a user need to be conscious of how many C knots you place on the circuit because that's really the big noise driver, just so you know. I would not recommend running running circuits that are more than three or four like uh, C knots uh, deep meaning like not on not let's say two C knots in parallel on a particular on two on different sets of qubits not such a big deal but layer if you layer your C knots then like you know having like three or four layers of C knots total is probably too much error and you're probably going to get junk back just to give you a sense of like where we are in terms of quantum volume etc um, but in principle Terra is supposed to be the place where you construct your circuits if you want to add individual gates to them and where you compile your circuits and it also contains some of the hooks to like a, a different uh, APIs so we have the API uh, for what was supposed to be next? We have the API for the for the hardware, uh, the 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 quantum hardware, but we also have um, our simulation suite, which is called Air. Oh. Air, which contains uh, a few different simulators. Under the hood, they're really the same simulator. They're just giving you back different sort of like ways of reading out your result, which I'll describe in a bit. Um, but Terra will also contain the hooks to that if you want to uh, run your circuit in simulation, which I highly recommend you do because it takes a long time to run on hardware. So if you're like writing an algorithm and sanity checking and everything like that, like if you the first thing you try to do is run on hardware, first of all, like you're never going to know if you're you're probably not. If, there's a 98% chance your result is going to be wrong on your first go because it takes a lot of tuning to run an algorithm correctly on hardware. But also, um, like uh, you're going to have to wait a long time. So it, most people sort of like build themselves up and test everything in simulation, and then they start to like run things on hardware to get like good like you know publishable results and stuff like that. So um, Air is that suite, and Terra contains the hooks into that. There are also simulators that people wrote that we support that are. Are, uh, totally third party and you can send your circuits to them through Terra um, you need to download the simulator and specify it but basically like there's like a, a kid in like Ireland or something like that that wrote a GPU based simulator that's like apparently very good and it just sub uh, supported as a third party simulator on the outside of Kiskit um, and it's not like he had to contact IBM and say hey can you officially support this Terra just has hooks so that people can do that um, Aqua is our algorithms and applications library. It contains uh, a lot of your textbook algorithms, like you know the sort of toy algorithms, like Deutsch Joza and Simon's algorithm. If you've heard of them, are in there. But then you've also got like uh, the factoring, Ashore's algorithm for factoring. Is there's an implementation in here? Again, it's more of a toy algorithm for now because no one was running this on hardware. But all of the modern algorithms are are, are also in here. So if you've heard of the uh, variational quantum eigen solver, that's a common modern algorithm for um, for everything chemistry optimization machine learning um, if you've uh, if you've seen any quantum machine learning algorithms out there they're in the aqua library and you can look at them they're a little bit hard hard to understand from looking at the raw source code in aqua because aqua is pretty highly engineered but we also have a whole suite of Jupyter notebooks that show implementations of these things in Terra so that you can go and look at them in, in more detail to understand what they're doing that uh, suite of notebooks is linked from the end of this uh, at the end of the notebooks it's the Kiskit tutorials repo on github um, and that has implementations of a lot of these algorithms just for learning purposes um, and aqua also contains application areas like yes uh, i was just curious um like shores algorithm do you think there's a day in the future where 
we will be allowed to run that on a quantum computer? A lot, I mean, it, for a large enough number, you could potentially run. By the time that a member of the public would be able to run on like a public device, uh, Shor's algorithm on a number which is high enough to be dangerous, it will already be, uh, will have already had the protections in place because there are large governments and corporations that will <laughs> attempt to run it before uh, an individual user would have the ability to do so. Probably like. 10 years before that. Okay. So yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah. Um, for the record, a lot of the academic algorithms that you might see, like Shor's algorithm or um, phase estimation, uh, there, there are a bunch of algorithms that, you, that were, that there were tons and tons of papers published about that uh, before we had access to real quantum hardware um, that are mainly sort of theoretical speed ups, like you could implement the algorithm, but in practice they require a degree of uh, error suppression on the devices, which is so high that you wouldn't really be able to access them uh, run those algorithms for quite a few years until we have active error suppression like that, which is called error correction. Um, so just know that there is this distinction between sort of modern algorithms and algorithms which have really good mathematical speed ups relative to the classical algorithms that you can run in simulation, no problem, but I, they would be difficult to run on a device. The other thing is there's uh, the, the thing that Brian showed you, the uh, preparing the bell state with a Hadamard and a, and a uh, a CNOT, you can run something like that no problem. If you try to then do quantum teleportation, which is sort of like the next natural extension of that, you can't run that on the current devices because they require you to perform a measurement of the qubits before you do subsequent operations on the qubits, which is no, not kosher right now. Right now, you can only do measurements at the end. There are a bunch of algorithms that require you to do measurement in the middle, including error correction. But uh, if you're going to try to run an algorithm on the device, just know all the measurements have to be at the, at the end. Um, uh, these are not coming soon. They are here. So, great. This is the announcement. They're here. So, um, Ignis is our uh, is our library of tools for suppressing and characterizing error on the qubits. So, when you perform a quantum circuit, the errors that happen, like random bit flips and things like that, that's a huge area of research because this point where we reach error correction is like a huge inflection point in what you can actually perform in the devices. And so, there's a library which is relatively small right now, and it's being built up of uh, of error correction, error suppression mitigation characterization tools. So these are the four major areas. They're all written in Python. Um, the ones that I think most people stick to in terms of actually looking at the code, uh, especially beginners, but our, or the areas I think that most uh, of the like uh, sort of active activity that I see are in Terra and Aqua as far as the public goes, because people who work on actually like uh, optimizing circuits, that's a pretty large area um, that can actually interact with our tools and run simulations and stuff like that. And people who work on algorithms and applications, also a very large area. In practice, the team that works on the simulators are mostly inside of IBM. And uh, they definitely take contributions. And it's all C++ if that's what you like. But um, and Ignis is, is relatively new. So I spend most of my time in Terra and Aqua personally. I run my simulations on air. But um, that's kind of where we are. And uh, this is what our public devices look like. You can actually look at the, uh, you can actually, uh, I don't have the page saved. Um, there's a, so there's a uh, inside of the IBM Q experience, there's a page that you can look at the connectivity of the device, meaning which qubits you can perform a CNOT in between them. Um, Excuse me. The uh, uh, the errors, I, which I don't show here on the device, are um, are also published publicly. So you can see how much error a single C not introduces, how much error um, your single cube rotations introduce. Readout, meaning reading out the the state, introduces some error. So that's all published publicly for the public devices um, and the private devices. Um, I mentioned before we have some twenty qubit machines and larger ones. Okay, so th this is the real picture of what our actual software looks like, which I mentioned. Um, Aqua, oh, chemistry is back in Aqua as of last week, so that's good. So Aqua has this separate module within it that is all of our chemistry stuff. Um, you've got uh, the, 
Yeah, actually, there's a pretty rich picture. Pretty, it's becoming the picture is becoming more accurate as time goes on. Um, meaning, not this picture. The picture I showed you before is becoming more accurate. Basic Air is a much lighter version of Air built on like um, NumPy, which is inside of Terra. So if you're having trouble installing Air, which a lot of people do have trouble with, um, you can just use this uh, lighter version, which is inside of Terra, called Basic Air. You'll see that inside the notebook. Okay. Um, are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, what am I? What am I wrapped at three? Uh, yes. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So the two notebooks that I included in Dropbox, which are um, uh, uh, quite large and mostly kind of just for going through on your own, are. Uh, a, a notebook specifically about Terra Air and this module, which is called the IBM Q Provider, which is kind of like the uh, where the API, uh, the actual API endpoints and stuff live. You don't really have to worry about the IBM Q Provider that much, but what you will use that for is when you're trying to run a circuit from inside of, when you're trying to actually execute a circuit in code, you'll have to like load your account and uh, and uh, like request a backend, which is sort of a Python object which is your representation of a backend. This, this IBM Q, um, IBM Q ob uh, class module is the thing that you can use to like request device properties over the API and stuff like that. Um, but th this is the first sort of major chunk, just Terra and Air. So constructing circuit simulation, stuff like that. And then um, the second is um, Aqua, including specifics about optimization, machine learning, and chemistry. So for the remaining time that we have, I'm going to just go through what constructing a circuit really looks like, so, so you understand what the, uh, the computation, the, the computational flow of Terra is, and then I'm going to go through uh, some very, very basic, basic stuff about Aqua, and just give you a sense of the computational flow there, and uh, in, uh, describe, if we have time, a very, very basic example of a modern um, quantum machine learning algorithm. Okay, um, let's see if my slides will render correctly. Maybe they will. Great. Um, this is a tool that can take your notebook. It's called Rise that can take your notebook and make it into, like, and make it presentable as a deck. Saved me a ton of time not creating a notebook and a deck in parallel. It's a great thing. Um, so, if you haven't done the installation, you can uncomment this line and uh, just run the cell, and uh, that will perform the installation in whatever environment you're actually working in. So um, from a high level, we describe what Terra is, but uh, just to sort of enrich your understanding, Terra it was originally built to compile, allow you to construct circuits and compile them down to a standard of uh, a standard way of describing quantum circuits, which is called Open Quasm, which is like quantum assembly language for circuits or something like that. Um, and we don't use Open Quasm anymore, but that's actually the thing at the, when, in the circuit builder where you're seeing like code updating as you drop circuits on. That's actually Quasm code. You can still technically use it, but Terra is not really built on top of it anymore. Um, Terra will allow you to, instead of compiling to open Quasm, we now uh, compile down to these JSON objects, which are called quabjs, or quantum object files, or quantum objects, similar to sort of like an object file that you get out of compilation in C. And that's the service that, that Terra provides. So um, there's also a module in there which is called Open Pulse, which is a way for outside researchers to actually define microwave pulse schedules that you can send down into the device. Uh, it's not available for the public yet, meaning that you can interact with the pulse library in Terra, but you can't actually send them into the devices, and I don't think that there's even a simulator yet. So it's kind of like uh, there and being eagerly awaited by a lot of people, because having microwave control of the device is a nice thing, but we're not going to talk about it much today. Um, just keep in mind that the tools are very experimental and are being updated constantly, and that is a good and a bad thing. It's bad because it means that things change over the courses of releases, which happen roughly once a quarter, so every once in a while if you update, you might have to make some changes, excuse me, to your existing code. But it's good because there are actually very, very few people who really actively uh, contribute or submit feature requests and stuff like that, like very, very few people. They're, they definitely exist. There are plenty of people who use the stuff and are vocal about it, but um, 
it's pretty easy to implement into the, the future direction of the code base. So I highly encourage you to get on our Slack channel and interact with people on the team. Everybody who works on Qiskit is on that Slack channel. So if you have questions, they're very willing to chat with people on that Slack channel or hear feature requests and stuff like that. Submit feature requests to the GitHub repos. Um, submit code. That's always a really nice thing. A lot of the time, people assume that code is there, which seems like it would be natural and obvious that it would exist. But we haven't had time to get to it yet. And it's stuff that like wouldn't necessarily take that long for a person who just knew their way around Python to write. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So there are a lot of opportunities to sort of shape things early on. Um, uh, this line is just to sort of filter out some warnings, which can get annoying. There's a lot of supplemental information that gets printed into notebooks a lot of the time. Um, OK, so this is the important stuff that we need to talk about. The, uh, the primary unit of computation in Terra is called the quantum circuit object. This is basically the thing that you're actually gluing gates onto and, um, and passing around, and you can glue circuits together. And, and this is the thing that you actually compile to submit. Um, and a quantum circuit has a regist quantum register and a classical register. These are mostly just placeholders. You barely will actually like interact with them. They don't really do a lot. But the point is basically that to say, like, OK, I'm producing using a circuit which has three qubits and three classical bits. And the way that this sort of flow of Terra is to an outsider is when you create a circuit and you um, manipulate your quantum register, your qubits, um, you can't actually observe that. You can only observe what's measured out. So when you perform a measurement, you perform a measurement from a quantum bit onto a classical bit. And then if you're working on error correction or algorithms that require you to have feedback in the opposite direction, you can do a conditional on a classical bit. So if a classical bit is equal to zero, meaning you measured something out onto it, you can then make it perform an operation on your quantum bit. Etc. So there are algorithms which depend on that. Like after you measured out a particular thing, then do something back to the circuit. You're doing that on the from the classical bits to the quantum bits. In practice, because you can't actually do that on hardware today, the vast majority of what you're going to do is on the quantum registers. And uh, but if you perform a simulation, uh, you will need to actually include measurements to be able to read the results, um, unless you do a specific type of simulation, which we'll get to. So the quantum circuit contains a few things inside of it. Oh, so. Um, this is the general structure. You create a quantum circuit with the quantum register and the classical register, yippee. Um, the quantum circuit contains a few things. It just it contains um, a name, which is uh, just for keeping track of it when you pass it around back and forth to different things. Uh, it contains uh, the data object includes all of its instructions, which are its gates on the different qubits. And it contains a register list, which is mostly for like bookkeeping um, what registers and classical registers are in there. Because you, as you might realize, the gates include lots of information about which register, which qubits are being pointed at, et cetera. Um, uh, the, uh, I highly recommend uh, going through this a notebook, which is linked here, which gives a very rich description of what gates we actually support and uh, and what the different gates that are like uh, what are the different gates that the device actually supports and what you can do inside of Qiskit. Um, Terra includes this direct. The gates are kind of hidden, but if you go to the Terra repo on GitHub and you look at extensions standard, that's where the list of actual gates are. Don't go into the gate section expecting for them to include lots of details about the behavior of that gate or the matrix that it represents or whatever, because the gate is really a placeholder. In practice, what we're really doing is we're taking what you're telling us as a user is an X, that you're intending to perform an X, but it's up to the simulator that so-and-so implemented or that we implemented or the quantum hardware to interpret what that actually means in terms of performing an action. So there's no, the gate, when you actually go and look at the object, is just going to be like, oh, this is an X gate. Whatever the hardware wants to do with that, they'll do. Um, this notebook is where you'll find a lot more detailed information. The, our devices don't support an X gate or a Z gate or anything or any of the gates that we've already talked about. They support these three gates, which are called U1, U2, and U3, which in principle you don't have to pay any attention to because the X and the Z, the U1 is really basically just a Z rotation. But um, they're they're just they're a more convenient way. They sort of arose naturally because they're a more um, uh, obvious way of representing the microwave pulses, but. Don't worry too much about that. Everything Terra compiles everything down to U1, U2, U3. Oh, my battery's going to die. Um, 
Okay, are there any questions about circuits just for from a construction standpoint? Okay. Um, we can print the, so here is, uh, we're applying a circuit, so we're, 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 up, we're adding gates to a circuit, we're applying gates onto a particular circuit. Here uh, we're adding a Hadamard gate by calling circuit.h, which is, that, that function is added dynamically from that uh, h object in the extensions folder. Um, and we add it on qubit zero, we index a qubit zero out of the quantum register. Um, the, and then after that you see that we perform a CNOT, the CNOT takes the first argument as the control, the second argument is the target qubit, and now we have that same bell circuit that we built. We can print the quasim if that's what you care about. Um, uh, oh, some of this, this line doesn't entirely apply anymore, but uh, we're already in, we're, we're up to Terra version 0.9, and uh, a lot of stuff for making sort of construction more powerful. Some of it was added in point uh, in, in 0.9, and some of it's being added as we continue along. The Terra version or the Aqua version or the subversions of the individual sections are different from the Qiskit version as a whole. Qiskit, we're up to like 11 as of yesterday or something like that. Um, we can draw a circuit, which is very convenient. If you just call circuit.draw, it will return this like ASCII art, like representation of a circuit, which is very convenient. Um, and then, and there's a whole notebook about visualizing circuits and results and all visualization stuff. Um, we talked a little bit about registers. You can add circuits together. So we added our bell circuit four times and then printed it. Oh, by the way, you don't have to call dot draw. You can actually just call print on a circuit directly and it'll it'll do the draw business for you. You can also draw in LaTeX or in Matplot, which is very nice if you're trying to put uh, fancy circuit diagrams in your papers. Uh, okay, so now let's execute. Um, we import air, which is a simulator suite. If you're having trouble with air, just change this to say basic air in camel case. And uh, this execute command, which is sort of like a convenience thing, it's like a global function in Qiskit that just sort of takes your uh, circuit and executes it on a particular backend. But uh, this is an important structure to get down. So the uh, provider module has a get backend function inside of it, and you give that get backend function a string and that's how you get actually like a Python backend object. That backend object, if it's, it does not contain, obviously does not contain the hardware or the simulator, it contains the hooks that you need to be able to submit to the, uh, to wherever you're submitting. And in the case of a, uh, an actual submission to quantum hardware, you don't want to be like sending your circuit into this Python object and then just like hanging there while it waits to compute, to complete for like a half an hour. What you're going to do in that case is you're going to pass the circuit into the backend object through this execute call, and then it's going to return a job to you. It's not going to return a result. So that's what, what's actually happening here. The job is the thing which you can ask, like, hey, is it done yet, or and other stuff like that. Um, but when you call execute on my cir on your circuit in your backend, you get back the job, and then you call job dot result, and this is the thing that will hang if you're waiting for a half an hour. Um, it will sit there and ping our servers like once every minute or something, or once every five seconds or something like that to ask it if the job is done. You might get a timeout error if you're doing this because it's taking a long time, well, meaning you're just like pinging the server and then there's actually a timeout limit which is baked into this result object. Um, you, can change the, uh, you can change the length of the timeout. This probably won't work. Yeah, there's, there's some arguments in the timeout, uh, in the result call where you can change the amount of time. I would change it to like an hour or more so that you don't error out while you're waiting for your circuit to complete. Um, but once we get our result object back, um, we call get counts on that result object to actually get the histogram of how, where the different measurements landed. So after we perform the circuit, we're going to get some uh, histogram. It's actually a dictionary. So in this case, we forgot to put measurements in our circuit. So all of our classical bits came back in the state zero, zero, zero. So this is the histogram. It's a dictionary which includes a string of a, of a particular state and the number of times that we measured that when we performed the computation. When I called execute, I could have included a shots argument here that would have said I want you know 8,000 shots or something like that. The default is 1,024. So that's why we have 1,024 total here. Um, but if I use another simulator, so in this case, we're using what's called the 
Blossom Simulator, which is the uh, the simulator inside of Air, which is supposed to sort of represent a device. So you send in a circuit, and it basically performs that Monte Carlo and measures. It can incorporate like a model to represent noise, which is built into Air that you can like in, you can like say what kind of noise you want the simulator to simulate. But in, by default, there's no noise. A simulator um, called the State Vector Simulator, where you don't need any measurements, and when you run it, the uh, the actually you can't have any measurements. When you run it, you get back the exact state vector of the uh, of the uh, wave function of the circuit at the very end. So you get, you know, instead of getting 50, 50 zeros and 50 ones back if you're just measuring a single qubit and you did a Hadamard, you will get uh, a a um, uh, a, a vector back, which has two to the n element, two two to the n meaning two to the number of qubits possible uh, um, uh, elements inside the vector, and they'll give the exact amplitudes of each of those states. So for the Hadamard case, you'll get uh, you know a, a root two for the for the in the zero position of the vector, and root two in the one position of the vector, or a minus root two if you did something else. So you can get the actual. Um, you don't have to necessarily perform the measurement and collapse the state in your simulation if you use the state vector simulator. There's also a simulator which is called the unitary simulator, which basically returns a matrix representation of what your circuit is actually doing. That's it's separate, but in that case, you wouldn't call get counts. In the case of state vector or unitary simulation, you wouldn't call get counts. You call get state vector or get unitary or something like that. This is the standard way to do it. But uh, so we forgot to add measurements. Let's add measurements. So we call uh, circuit dot measure for, uh, and we're measuring from our quantum register onto our classical register. So this is a shorthand way of saying you can do it for individual bits. So this is a shorthand way of saying do it on all the quantum bits onto all the classical bits, and then we're going to execute it again. And see now we get our actual correct number of uh, counts back. So we measured 50% uh, of our counts have this one one um, have a, a measured out with a uh, 0, 1, 1, and we didn't touch the third qubit. Excuse me. By the way, don't worry about the circuit, like the collapsing things to the left. It just does that. It doesn't actually have any bearing on what happens in reality. So th this measurement collapsing this way, don't worry about it. It won't collapse in ways which are not actually, this is mostly just a printing thing. There's nothing, like the, it, it's not actually doing this stuff under the hood. Um, but uh, so we did nothing on qubit, qubit 2. So it makes sense that it stayed 0 in both, both cases. But we uh, prepared a Bell state for qubit 1 and 2. So it makes sense that we would measure out the 1, 1 for close to half of them and zero zero for another close to half for the other half. Notice that it's not exactly half, even though there's no noise here, because um, this is a Monte Carlo. It's using your computer's random number generator to sample from what the result is supposed to be. There's no noise, right? Noise is where the actual C naught changes the the state of the of the, the quantum state in a way that you didn't expect. But uh, the quantum state stays consistent. It just when you perform a measurement, it's stochastic. That's how the quantum world works. Um, so we got our results and. Uh, there is a more detailed description of kind of what happens in between. Uh, Terra is going uh, in the, inside of the execute call. There's this um, transpile call. The transpiler is the thing that takes your circuit and manipulates it so it can actually fit on hardware. So if you want to see what is actually being submitted, just to make sure that they're like, see if something is is uh, is, is messy with your with your circuit, if something's not executing executing correctly, you can call transpile on your circuit and it will uh, and. And, and the circuit you get back from the transpile call will be the one that you're that it's uh, you can call, call transpile on your circuit and your device that you're planning on submitting it to. And the circuit you get back is the thing that Terra would actually submit to the device that hasn't yet. And it's doing that under the hood. It's calling transpile on your circuit, and then it's calling uh, assemble, which actually turns the transpiled circuit into a quabj, and then it's um, actually submitting the quabj, calling um, backend dot run on the quabj, and that's how the submission actually happens. So that's the flow. Um, there's a bunch of notes on transpilation here, and there are some more detailed examples performing um, teleportate, quantum teleportation and quantum phase estimation, um, which you can go through on your own. Um, and in the eight minutes that we have left, I want to give you a very, very high level description of what uh, of, of Aqua and uh, what you can do in Aqua. So yeah, was there a question? No? Okay. Um, 
So Aqua is our is structured pretty differently from that. Um, it's also Python, and it basically is just built on top of Terra. Everything that it does in terms of submitting circuits and all that kind of stuff is Terra stuff. Um, but the, uh, the structure of it basically is um, you have a bunch of these different interfaces. Um, it's not a library of circuits. Circuits do not equal algorithms, okay? The circuits are used by algorithms to perform some subunit of the computation, okay? But what it's actually doing under the hood is it's prepare, you're gonna tell Aqua, you're gonna ask Aqua for a, an, uh, an object representing a particular algorithm, and you're gonna give it settings, and you can mess around with the components of that algorithm. When you call execute, Aqua is preparing the circuits and submitting them and things like that. Or it might not be when you call execute, maybe when you do some setup, but it's just, it's managing a lot of the actual execution and control of the algorithm itself, and it contains the implementations of the algorithm. There are a lot of these components which are used in many algorithms that you uh, that you can mix and match when you're working with Aqua. So if the algorithm includes an optimizer, like if you've done any machine learning, oftentimes you have a choice of which optimizer you'd like to use, then Aqua has a choice of different optimizers you can pass into an algorithm. Or if the, uh, if the algorithm requires you to create like a freeform circuit with some sort of freeform parameters in it, uh, Aqua will allow you to choose which of a bunch of different freeform circuits you'd like to use as the base circuit for what you're trying to do. And then when you actually call run, it'll either you know do the back and forth of the simulator or it'll execute with the with the hardware. Um, so uh, there's uh, some detail in here about the actual interfaces into Aqua, but. Um, I'm going to just show you one thing which um, is a little bit interesting and is an example of a modern algorithm which is accessible to you, um, which is accessible to you with only what you've learned today. Um, there was a paper that was published on the cover of Nature by some IBM researchers a few months ago, which was about quantum support vector machines. And let's see if, okay. So um, what a quantum support vector machine is, and I'm just, I'm just gonna, don't worry about the slides, I'm just gonna basically describe it to you. The way that this basically works is, um, suppose that I had a circuit with a bunch of rotations in the circuit and a bunch of CNOT gates just sort of in there randomly, like just like packed it with rotations and CNOTs, okay? But the rotations were not, the parameters of the individual rotations were not defined ahead of time. They were kind of like a free form parameter that I could control and tune, okay? So, um, Let's say I had a particular task that I wanted to complete. In this case, the task of classification. So I have a particular set of data, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, in, like samples, which are each just a vector, and each vector has let's say like five elements or something like that, or we'll do two elements in this case. And I want to classify that data subject to some labels that I already know about. So I have a bunch of training data. Each of the vectors have a label. It's the label is like yes or no for each of those vectors. And then I have. Uh, testing data that I want to, the, my classifier to take each of those vectors and predict what it thinks the label is supposed to be. This is the machine learning task of classification. What I'm, another way of describing what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to learn a function from the vector onto the label, right? For a given vector, my function takes in my, my piece of data and it returns a label for that particular piece of data. Um, another way that we can perform that computation or estimate that function or learn that function is using our quantum circuit. So what the algorithm essentially does is it takes your it takes your you you start with a circuit with your freeform parameters. You start with some initial state for your freeform parameters, like you know, set them all to zero or something like that, or set them randomly. So all these rotations and CNOTs, all these rotations are essentially set randomly initially. You um, plug in your uh, your vector of your sample data at the beginning of the circuit as a rotation. So you encode your data onto the circuit as like Y rotations or something like that. So now the data is represented in the state of the qubits before they reach this random crazy section. And and then you measure out the result, and you let's say take the parity of the result, or you sum of something that if, if the parity is equal to zero, you call that the, you say that the circuit produced a yes call about your data, or if it produced, the parity is zero of your string that you read out of your measurements, you say that it produced a no call, a no label for the the vector which was plugged in. 
And what you can do is you can plug each of your data vectors into the circuit, run it, figure out what your circuit says, yes or no, for each of these data vectors in your training data set, and compare what the circuit said to your solution. Okay, so you do this for all of your training data, and you get a bunch of labels back, and you compare them to the labels, which are the true labels about the data, and you get an accuracy number. Okay, so that accuracy number basically tells you how good this random circuit is at giving you a classification of your data. Okay, like a, a classifier function of your data. And now what you can do is do what the machine learning people do, is just optimize those random rotations inside of your circuit using a classical optimizer to minimize the error number that you get at the end. So after you've Run, you you tune those rotations over the uh, over the you you tune those rotations let's say to be slightly better using like a, a like a gradient based optimizer um, and after you've tuned the rotations you try again with all of your data and you see what your total accuracy was and you optimize let's say you minimize the uh, inaccuracy over the course of the circuit uh, over the over all of your data and by the end of all this after you do all the optimization what you're left with is the exact set of rotations so that your circuit optimally classifies your data. Okay, so by the end of it, you're left with a circuit that performs the task that you wanted all along, which is to be able to take a, one of your vectors out of your, your testing set and produce a label for that vector. Whether you can actually learn that circuit is another question. It depends what's in the, that random like bunch of circuits. But this is, a, uh, this is an example of a machine learning algorithm you can you do on a quantum circuit that this paper um, indi like has, you know, show to prove that there's a, a, a certain type of speed up over classical associated with this. So uh, this is a totally modern algorithm. This is like, was just published a few months ago or weeks ago. And this is a, uh, you know, a different way that you could imagine the field of classical computation could have gone, right? If we had access to classical computers when we were doing it. Rather than build up all these little adders and things like that that are actually in the computer, you can basically just take a classical optimizer and optimize the components to do the thing that you want them to do. And this is sort of one regime of quantum algorithms which is called variational algorithms which are sort of a very promising set of algorithms for modern hardware because you can use such small circuits and then just optimize them to do what you want. So I just wanted to kind of describe that to you from a high level. There are much more details in this notebook about it and how you can do it through Aqua but that's sort of an example of a modern algorithm which you only really need to know about rotations to understand. Okay, um, I think that's my time. Are there any questions? Or if there are questions, you can also come over to me afterwards, but are there any questions now? Yeah. Good question. Um, there are a ton of resources. A bunch of them are inside of the uh, quantum experience. Um, at the very bottom of this notebook, there's a list of resources for learning more. Um, there's this lear learning more page. So one of them is this, um, my things will render correctly. One of them is this KidsKit Tutorials repo, which is just a repo inside of the KidsKit Tutorials GitHub organization, which includes a bunch of, uh, a bunch of um, instructive notebooks about lots of different topics. One of them is inside of the IBM Q experience. Um, there are some very common textbooks that everybody uses. So there's uh, one of them, which is the Nielsen and Schwang. Um, everybody calls it the Mike and Ike, but uh, it's a very common one for learning the, learning uh, quantum information and quantum computation uh, from sort of from scratch. Uh, it certainly helps if you already know physics, so you sort of have an advantage there. I had to learn it coming from only computer science, um, and it's a little bit uh, messier. And I had a document somewhere. Um, there's a document oh, at the bottom of this deck. Uh, I don't remember where the document is, but there, yeah, this one. So this is the path, I actually wrote this up, there's a path that I took uh, when I was ramping up on quantum computing that kind of describes, and I was coming with no physics, so uh, that describes sort of my path, and that's linked in one of the notebooks, but I'll just post it into the Dropbox so you can, you can see it and 
see what kinds of things I did. This was a, over a year ago, so it's not really like the, you know, it might not be the best thing available to you, and there's a lot of educational stuff, which uh, which uh, Brian's team have already done that are in the IBM Q experience that I think you showed. Um, so th there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of resources out there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, and this is going to be, I think, my view of it. But hardware wise, when you like, IBM is currently at this generation of computers, right? What's the, I mean, what's the fit, like the max fit that you guys can run with? Right now, we only have we have twenty bits, and in practice, the what we actually use of that, like what a, a normal algorithm will use, is only like you know less than ten or something like that, okay. because you're just you, the C not limit is much more restrictive than the actual a bit limit. So uh, the uh, the stuff that just happened, which is to, like really like practical happening on hardware, but not practical, like that, that's actually running on hardware, is in the order of like three to four bits, really. Like three to four bits, three to four C knots deep. I do some, I, I just did some stuff which was eight bits and like uh, like seven or eight C knots deep on the private hardware. The That's just what my algorithm happened to need, and I was like very glad to see that it was actually executing and pretty surprised, frankly. But uh, the, the pace of problems progress is a little bit hard to predict. Um, over the years, things I think have gone a lot faster than people expected for the last like few sort of rounds of improvement, but it's very difficult to say if you were someone who really knows about the problems that we're facing on the hardware side, like it's very difficult to say if like those last things were a fluke and now they're going to get difficult or everything's just going to, the errors are going to keep on getting better and better. So it's, it's very difficult to predict kind of like what the limits will be in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, but the maximum, maximum number of qubits and C naught square that we've been able to simulate in like a reasonable time on that massive supercomputer at Oak Ridge was 44 qubits by 44 C naughts. So the limits are pretty low. Like that, I think, took like a week or something like that, or a few days to do one circuit, 44 qubits, 44 C naughts. So just like you, just to give you an understanding, that's the best supercomputer on the planet. So, yeah. Is, is IBM hiring physicists? You know, so what kind? We uh, yes. Yeah, so IBM's hiring um, all kinds of physicists. Um, on my team, we have quantum information scientists, um, someone from optics, condensed matter. Um, uh, on other teams, you've got people who come from quantum chemistry, and uh, we have some mathematicians. They're hiring anyone and everyone who uh, can code can uh, uh, understand quantum algorithms given uh, sufficient time to, and uh, understands the needs of modern computation in lots of sort of high computation, high uh, intensive computational areas. So like um, uh, quantum chemistry, finance, machine learning, optimization, these types of things are things which require, which were computationally limited by today. High energy physics is a good example um, that we're limited by today and therefore sort of present interesting opportunities. So if you're interested, we're hiring uh, mostly PhDs, like people who've recent, recently completed a PhD or have some research behind them um, for research positions. There are also lots of positions that sit between research and software engineering, which you which you probably don't require a PhD to do, So, if you, but you need a stronger code. So if you have a lot of code behind you or um, want to take an interest in KizKid and contribute to the repos, that's a great way to catch the interest of some people who are hiring software engineers. Um, if you're interested in any of this, you can shoot me an email. My email is actually linked in these uh, notebooks. Um, yeah, my email is linked in the notebooks. We're hiring all kinds of people. My team in particular is like, if you have pretty strong code, pretty strong uh, quantum uh, quantum information, like you were able to learn on your own or you did your PhD doing research, and you can, you know, learn about machine learning really quickly or learning about chemistry really quickly or already know about them, that's a huge plus. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody.